Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. John, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me today. Man, it's such a pleasure and honor to have you on here. I can't tell you how excited I am uh, for this interview. So I guess just out of the gate, did you start investing in small asset first or did you just jump right into multifamily? Well, Sam, I guess a little bit of both. <laughs> so I did start with multifamily, but I started with small multifamily. Okay. So my first investment was a two unit. I house hacked it. It's a strategy that I highly recommend for anyone especially in the early stages of their life. So if you, you know, don't have kids running around and all that kind of stuff, it's a great way to get in. You know, you go from living in apartments to owning a small apartment building, living in one unit, renting out the other units, building equity, and the best part, you only have to use 3.5% down payments to get in. So great financing available. It's a phenomenal strategy. So we did that and from there we were able to scale and grow. Wow. How, what was the timeline uh, from, you know, and how many of those two unit did you have? And then, then what was the timeline to actually going into much larger assets for you? Yeah. So we bought a duplex in 2012, bought a three unit building in 2014. And uh, in 2016, we bought an eight unit building. Okay. So for me, what happened was we were using all of our own money. So we we're saving, saving, saving. I had a kid in 2014. We actually had the second kid in 2016. So the same years we were buying our second and third assets. And ultimately what happened was I realized we were not going to be able to save at the same capacity, even though we had these income producing assets, you know, our cost had just, you know, doubled, if not tripled with the kids. So it wasn't going to be the same. And honestly, saving a hundred thousand dollars plus to go and buy an asset, um, that takes a, a bit of a toll. And we just stepped back and said, there's got to be a better way to do this, right? We had people asking us questions about it. How do you get into it? How do you do it? And finally, we interviewed a few people who had scaled their portfolio significantly. One was a good friend of mine who went from nine units to 90 units. And wow. I sat down with her and I said, how did you do it? And the answer was really simple. She used partners. She started partnering with other people and letting them bring most of the capital. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, it just crystallized to me that if you really want to scale in multifamily, you really have to be open to partnerships. So right. the next deal we did was actually a partnership deal. And instead of it going from the eight units that I was doing, that deal was 192 units. Wow. Wow. Were you, were you an active partner in that next deal or were you a passive partner? I was an active partner in that deal. Okay. And so what, uh, obviously you developed some skill set, um, you know, in the smaller assets along the way, but if someone were listening to this and said, Hey, you know, I've got experience buying two, you know, two plexes, four plexes, things like that. What did you bring to the table for that 190? Um, it was 190 units. What, what did you bring to the table for that acquisition that, that the other partners were like, Hey, you know, we're excited to have John on board. How, how yeah, did you sell yourself? Absolutely. A couple of things. First and foremost, you know, it starts with relationships. And for us, we had been networking and building relationships for a while. Once I kind of made the decision mentally to say, okay, I am ready to scale into multifamily. I am ready to bring on investors and partners. Mm -hmm. The first thing I did was actually I hired a mentor. And I will tell you, I'm glad that it happened that way, but I, I don't want it to come across like I said, okay, now I need to hire a mentor. That's not what happened. Right. I just decided that I, it was literally, we closed on that property in November. I kind of made a mental decision that we were ready to scale and start working with other investors. A month later, I randomly had a lunch meeting with a guy who was actually mentoring other people on how to get into multifamily, larger scale, working with investors. And I said, man, this is, this is exactly what I'm trying to do next. Great. So I, I signed up and it was really that, that simple. And from there, that network opened up to me. So networking and relationships was really mm -hmm. key. I met my partners eight months before we ended up doing a deal together. Sure. And it just came to fruition very naturally. They were looking for deals. I was looking for a deal. And it got to the point where I said to them, listen, you guys look like you're a little bit closer than what I am. If I can help and be a value to the team, I'm happy to come on board. I can help with marketing. I can help with marketing research, doing some analysis there, uh, tapping into my background, my commercial and corporate background. I can also... 
you know, help with investor relations, bringing some investors, but then also with the asset management, right? And some of the communication. So mm-hmm. those are the things that I brought to the table, but it really started with the fact that these relationships had begun prior to any one of us even considering partnering. So when we had that conversation, it was just more natural or organic to say, Hey, you know what? Yeah. Vice versa. If you find something and you need some help or we could be a value, we'll do the same thing. So for us, it was really organic in the way it kind of started. And when they, when they found that first deal and we had that conversation, it meshed up and it worked out. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so from that, from that acquisition till now, I mean, you have, you have just exclusively focused then on the multifamily space. Is that right? That's right. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so what, what, I guess, so that was 2016? 2017, I think we did that deal. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's some rapid growth going yeah. from a, you know, owning, a, owning a, a few assets to now you said you own 90 million plus in assets. Like that, that's, that's incredible. And so did you, were you still working a W2 at that point? Uh, or when you finally made that plunge, did you just cut bait with the, the W2 and, and go right into full time? Uh, how did that transition work? Yeah. I mean, here's one of the beautiful things about multifamily investing, working with partnerships and having scale. I was still able to keep my W2 job. Now, right. For context, I was an executive in the company, right? I was a senior director in the business. So I had more flexibility. I had a team underneath me. And honestly, I could manage my workload and still kind of manage what we needed to do with multifamily. Because the good thing is that when you go with scale, right, you're buying larger multifamily. First of all, you have a full-time property management company, right? You got a property manager on site. You are doing more asset management. So Mm -hmm. that's more weekly calls, things like that. And honestly, my partners were handling a lot of those kind of things. So right. for me, it was mostly the investor relations. We had already done a lot of the marketing stuff. So we were still having ongoing conversations, you know, our GP calls, things like that. But I wasn't necessarily having to spend, uh, you know, 40 hours a week just on this asset or, or the assets that we had. So mm-hmm. it allowed me to keep my W-2 job while we scaled the business. And then eventually I went full time into the real estate business and left the W-2 job. Was that a scary transition for you? It was, you know, it was definitely scary. And it was one of those things where it helps to see other people do it, understand what decisions they made, what feedback they have, what advice they have for you. And I will say the biggest thing for me is I'm a hard worker. You know, I, I've had a job since I was 13 years old. Sure. Um, and I, there was really about a six month period that I did not work. And it was just because I was a freshman in college and I wanted to give everything to it because I was fearful that I would flunk out or something bad would happen. And sure. I was going to be one of those people who went to school and, and just came back, you know, after the first quarter. So I decided not to work at that time. Mm-hmm. But that's the only time frame I did not have a consistent check. And I'm talking through 2001, I'm talking through 2008, 2009. I have never missed a paycheck. Wow. So for me to go from that W2 mindset, I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit, but I also had that security of that W2 check coming in, you know, every two weeks or or twice a month. So to, to step away from that and to realize that, hey, you know, if if something goes wrong, it's all on me. That was a little little bit of a difficult transition to make. But I surrounded myself with great people who just kind of reassured me that, listen, you know how to make it work, though. If something does happen, the solutions are in front of you. You have the resources, you have the network. Focus on what can happen as opposed to you know, what can go wrong. Right. So it sounds like some of some of your key, you know, some of the key takeaways from this conversation is one, your partners and, and two, surrounding yourself with the right people. Cause I think you said you, you hired a mentor along the way. So as you made that transition, uh, it, it just became uh, much easier for you to do that. than I guess if you were just a, a go it alone person, that's, that's fantastic. Okay. So let's, um, let's talk about this. Let's, let, what would what would be something that someone could do to get started in apartment investing? Like if you came to me and I said, hey, John, look, man, I'm uh, just an average Joe and I'm really excited about apartments. I think it's great. Where in the world would I start? How, how do I scale that? Like what's the yeah, first listen, thing I should do? There's a few things you can do to get in, right? The very first thing you should do, right? And I'll have this conversation. You need to do an assessment. What do you really want? Because 
as great as this is, this can become another job, right? I mean, I'm not sitting here on a beach in Hawaii with my feet kicked up. Right. You know, we're working. And I'm, I know people in Hawaii who do this too, but, uh, but you know, we're working. You know, it's still work. It's not as strenuous as working an 80 hour work week, but sure. there's still a lot of work that goes into it. So the question oh, yeah. is, why do you want to get into multifamily? What problem are you solving? Mm. Are you just trying to quit your day job? Or are you trying to create more free time with your family? Because that's going to dictate the next piece of advice I give you. If you are looking to create some financial freedom, some flexibility in your life, you know, give you another stream of income, the first thing I would highly suggest is consider being a passive investor, being mm. a limited partner. And the reason for that is you don't have to deal with any of the headaches of being a landlord or a property manager or even the asset manager. Once you invest your money, you are really just checking out you know, the email updates and getting the distributions and things like that. But it's truly passive. No more work is needed on your end. Mm -hmm. So if you are doing this to change your lifestyle, to have more free time with your family, that's a great way to get started. And you don't have to know every single thing to be a limited partner. You know, all you need to do is find good people to work with. You need to understand market market dynamics. And you need to understand how to underwrite a deal or analyze the potential risk in a deal. Okay. Which is, that takes a little bit of time, but finding the right people to work with is really the biggest thing because they're going to take care of the other two things. So limit being a limited partner is the first thing I would suggest if you're doing this to have more free time in your life. Right, right. And that's a great point. I mean, I don't know if you invest passively in other syndications. I know I do just because when it comes to things like, um, you know, self-directed IRAs and things like that, we can't directly invest in our own deals. And so I've taken those funds and put them in other syndications. And I will say I did that starting um, really in the beginning of my investing career, just like you're suggesting. And that made a huge world of a difference because I was able to learn along the way. I mean, I got a, I got a, I got a class A education in reading private placement memorandums and all, all those things. I didn't know anything about it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I love real estate. I've done a bunch of this type of real estate, but never anything on scale. And so as I started investing in those deals, just like you're saying, man, that, that was awesome. So that, that's a great point. So I guess some of the key takeaways, uh, one, you know, obviously finding mentors to potentially invest in uh, a limited partnership. Um, you work with a lot of corporate investors and people like that. And I guess that would be also something you would tell them as well. Hey, come alongside as an LP and learn. Is that right? That's exactly it. Because I mean, for a lot of people, they're not trying to sign up for a second job. <laughs> so <Right. laughs> if you don't want a second job, be a passive investor. Now, for some people, they say, hey, listen, I want that. I want the grind. I want to put in the work. I want to be on the active side. That's great. For those people, as long as you understand the commitment and the hard work that it takes, for those individuals, the first thing I would say is it takes three C's to be a great syndicator or to attract capital for your deals. Okay. The first is going to be confidence. Mm. That comes from preparation. You know, how much did you study? How prepared are you about not just the overall industry and terms and that stuff, but the deal, the market, right. you know, all of those things. The second is going to be your credibility. Okay. And the credibility, you could call it competence, but credibility. And it's, it's about you. What have you done in your professional space? It doesn't have to be a multifamily right now, mm -hmm. but what have you done that would make people believe that you are capable of doing this. Right. And again, you need to lean into whatever successes you've had. And that is something that you can bring to the table because those skills are transferable. At the end of the day, multifamily investing, it's still business. Right. So if you have any kind of business skills or business successes, those things work and they will help you succeed here. The mm -hmm. other thing you can do is surround yourself with other people who have that experience. So we talked about a mentor, right. partners, you know, property managers. If you surround yourself with a team that has that experience, that also is going to help build your credibility in what you're trying to do. The last thing and the most important thing, you're going to need connections. You know, you're going to need brokers to, to send you deals. You need those people we just talked about. You're probably going to need investors if you're taking down bigger deals. So you'll need those connections to be a successful investor as well. Right. So we've got, we've got credibility, we've got um, confidence and connections. Those are the three C's that you would say 
uh, that someone would need in order to, to uh, obviously get started. So you went from, um, obviously found this one deal and this will be my last question on this. Then we'll move into the final four. Uh, but what's the best way to find an area for investing? Like how, how did you do it? I mean, one day you just woke up and said, Oh, I'm going to invest here or, you know, you can't scale to 90 million without having some very specific target markets in mind. How, how did you do that? Yeah. So listen, when I launched my podcast, Target Market Insights, I launched it specifically to answer that question. I had been living in Chicago, investing in Chicago and having great success. Wow. But as I went to every single deal, I, I got pushed further and further outside of the markets I really wanted to be in. Sure. Even my sub markets, you know, I was in North Center and I got pushed out of North Center to Avondale. I really wanted to go to Logan Square, but the numbers were a little bit off, right? right. So Avondale gave great value. Then I got pushed to Hermosa. And as I started to expand, into Cincinnati and other markets, I had this same issue. It's like, how do I find the best places to invest? So uh, in the first, I don't know, 50 episodes or so, I pretty much asked all of the guests the same question. Sure. And we came up with uh, some, some free hacks and some tips. The first thing is you want to take a look at population. Mm. You know, um, what's happening with the population on a macro level and then also on the sub-market level. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be in the biggest population growth markets, but it does help if people are moving there. Why do people move to a place? Jobs. Right. So what new jobs are coming to an area? What employers are there? You want to look at those kind of things, right? That's going to make sure that there's a renter base that will occupy your apartments. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, you want to make sure that the place is business friendly and landlord friendly, just because you are trying to project out you know, what you're going to do. And if, if it's tough to do business in an area, that's just going to add unnecessary challenges to your underwriting, to your business plan. It's just easy to do business in a market that is business friendly, landlord friendly. Okay. Right. Um, if when I'm looking for kind of that key sub market or, you know, what's a good tail after I look at jobs, now I'm starting to look at the amenities, nightlife, Mm. schools, um, how close is your freeway or the interstate, trains from a city like Chicago or a big city, you know, sure. how close is it to the train or the, the preferred mode of transportation, right? So you're looking at those things because that's going to dictate demand. And ultimately, you want to be in a place where demand is strong right. or at a minimum, demand is increasing. So you can invest in a place that's on the up, you know, the up and up or it's coming up, but make sure that there's something else driving that demand not you. You right. cannot renovate an entire neighborhood by yourself. Don't be that cocky, okay? Right. Let somebody else do the heavy lifting. Look at what the government's doing. Are there TIFs? So TIF, tax, tax, tax increment funding. Mm -hmm. um, are there other developers who are developing there? Other flippers who are flipping houses there? You want somebody else to do the heavy lifting. Right. You want to be a settler, okay? Let them be the pioneers. You come in and be a settler right behind them. That's really the best way to find uh, the best places to invest. That's awesome. That's awesome. Let's jump into the final four because I don't, don't want to take up uh, more of your time than I need. Um, but so if you were to tell somebody one thing, if there's just one piece of advice that you could give somebody that was an aspiring investor that, that wanted to scale, what's that one thing you would tell them to do right now? Go do this. What is it? Man, first of all, read and surround yourself with the right people with the right mindset because mm -hmm. who you surround yourself with and how you educate yourself, that's going to dictate your success. Perseverance is key and being around people that have persevered is going to really help you succeed. Right. And it sounds like that might be close to your answer for number two, which is investing in yourself. What's one thing you do to stay on top of your game? Well, I mean, I host my podcast and I will tell you this, it's great for a lot of different reasons. Uh, you know, it's great to get your name out and things like that, but I enjoy having conversations just like this. Right. And I get a chance to talk to some of the brightest minds across the country when it comes to investing and so many other things that it really helps me stay sharp. Outside of that, reading, reading all these books is really helpful for me to stay sharp too. Right, right. Okay. Question number three, investing in the world. What's one thing that you are doing to make the world a better place? You know, I'm on the board for an organization called Search for Water and Search for Water invests in sustainable water solutions mm. in underserved countries like Uganda, the Dominican Republic, uh, the Philippines and Haiti. So that's something I'm really passionate about. We take water and clean water for granted. Um, and I'm not talking just like bottled water. I'm talking 
bathing water and, you know, drinking water and going to school. And they're in these countries, you know, little girls and little boys, they have to carry, you know, gallons of water on their shoulder for miles and miles to go to the well. And uh, we try to invest in these communities. So it's a little bit easier on them and they can actually uh, grow and really invest in themselves. So it's really self-sustaining, not just a one-time donation. So I'm really proud of that organization and the work we do. You can learn more at searchforwater.org. That's awesome. Yeah, it's funny. Um, not really ha ha funny, but it is interesting how most of our bathing water is probably far cleaner than what the bulk of the world has for drinking water. So that's, uh, that's really, really awesome. Lastly, um, if people want to get in touch with you, learn more about you, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, listen, if you want to learn more about real estate investing, I have a sample deal package on my website. You can go to kasmancapital.com slash sample deal. Uh, that's the best place to go. And if you want to check out the podcast, Target Market Insights, you can just Google that anywhere you listen to podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and uh, it's right there. But either one of those two places is great. That's awesome. And Kasman Capital, that's spelled C-A-S-M-O-N, Capital. That's awesome. John, hey, thanks so much for being on the show today. It was a pleasure interviewing you. I can't wait to connect further in the future. And um, yeah, maybe we'll do some deals together. Appreciate it. Absolutely, Sam. Thank you for having me on the show today. Take care. Awesome. Thanks, John.